Every working day, six and a half million Australians go to work. Of these, almost half are employed in small business. Significantly, small business, those employing 100 people or less, account for more than 90% of all Australian enterprises. Clearly then, in Australia, small business is big business. While small business enjoys many advantages over larger organisations, they are more flexible, more personal, require less capital to get started and offer greater financial rewards, there are problems. Business loans and credit are often difficult to get and in some cases impossible. Specialised professional services, accounting and legal work are expensive and many small businesses are unaware of the helping hands available through government agencies. Consequently, the failure rate of small business is high. Of the businesses which fail, almost half fail in the first two years, while a staggering two-thirds fail in the first five years. Oftentimes, the tragedy of an entrepreneur's dream collapsing in bankruptcy could have been avoided if the entrepreneur had acquired the necessary business skills before having a go. What follows are the stories of five entrepreneurs who succeeded and the lessons they learned along the way. The need for creative self-expression, which is in all of us, was the driving force behind Vera Randall starting up Knitwit in 1971. Now, by teaching women an easy method of making their own clothes and by providing the quality material to make them, Vera Randall has turned what was a $4,000 overdraft into a $20 million a year business spanning 102 franchise stores in four countries across the world. A chance visit to a neighbourhood sewing class in Canada as the guest of a friend she was visiting gave her the idea to have a go in business. She calls it providence or fate, but within 24 hours, Vera had made the decision. Teaching women to make their own clothes at home would be her business, big business. After you decided to go into business, how much research did you do before you actually started the business up? Well, having made the decision, it happened very quickly in that very first 24 hours, I spent three very intense months working in Canada and the United States, uh, learning everything I could about sewing, about franchising and the way that the manufacturers sewed in their workrooms over there. So it was intense. It was three months, day and night, just living the whole thing. I think we've got a winner there. How tough or demanding has it been? Well, for the first 10 years it was. There's no other way to describe it. I was working 18 and 20 hour days. Uh, there was very little time for a social life. Um, I had lots of time for my son. Of course, that was paramount uh, in my priorities. But it was a real hard slog. On the other hand, I must always say that there's a wonderful exhilaration that comes from doing the thing that you want to do most in life. I'm glad you've used that because lace is going to be important next season too. What would you consider to be the key points of success in business? Well, in my case, I'd say that was first of all that I knew what I was doing when I went into business. It wasn't some flight or some flood of idea or a fantasy. And I think a lot of people have the idea of going to business, but you know, they can't dissociate the real hard work from the fantasy. And then the next step that I took was to define my objective. And I wrote this down in one sentence, that my objective was to teach Australian women a fun, easy method of home sewing. So I knew what I was setting out to do. And then I set myself a goal, which was to open 50 stores in Australia by 1980. And then I wrote a plan of how I was to do it. Now, that's the mechanics of success in business, I believe. But as well, you've got other ingredients, you know, sheer determination, enthusiasm. You know, and you can only feel this if you really believe in your product the way that I believe in Knitwit. And then you can sort of take it to the next stages as the business grows, where you can't do everything yourself to make sure that you have all of the right people around you. Now, I did this little by little. My accountant today is a woman that I met in a sewing class in 1973. But she was just right. She was the right person. So to know when to stop trying to do everything yourself is important too. For people that haven't had the experience that I've had, I strongly recommend that they go along to one of the government-sponsored small business agencies and learn the, the basics of being in business and then go along from time to time to update those skills. And in those days, when you put your plans to potential associates and your friends and so on, what was their reaction? 
I don't think many of them took the whole thing seriously. And I think from within the industry, those that were prepared to listen to me were just a little bit patronising. And that didn't do any harm, that just made me more determined to keep on. Because if you really believe in your product and you believe in what you're doing, don't be swayed by people around you, and especially people in your, the industry that you're going into. Your first marriage broke down amidst all this. How much of that was because of your single-mindedness to succeed? I'm always very happy to talk about this because I believe that if that first marriage had been sound, that the business coming along would have added a new dimension to that marriage that we could have both shared. But it didn't work out that way. Um, so I'm very emphatic that the business didn't cause the breakdown of the marriage. If the marriage and the, the family unit is sound and everyone stops to think about what the woman's going to do in either re-entering the workforce or going into business, and everyone understands what's going on, I think it can work very nicely. And I know for me, having spent seven or eight years at home as a single mother in business, uh, which was tough, uh, but then going on and remarrying just four years ago, uh, I know the delights now of being married to someone that I love very dearly, who's supporting me in this business every step of the way. Where will this company be in 10 years' time? In 10 years' time, I plan to have Nitwit in 10 countries of the world. 10 times as big? That's right. 10 times the turnover. The Maritime Services Board Tower, known as the Pill, is the nerve centre for a complex communication network for one of the busiest port facilities in the world. Every year, almost 3,000 ships move through Sydney Harbour and Botany Bay, handling 32 million tonnes of cargo. A relatively small but dynamic and innovative Australian-owned and operated computer company, J.N. Almgren, won the contract over international competition to design and manufacture this high-technology telecommunications equipment. When you first decided to have a go in business, what business skills did you have? Effectively none. Uh, it was a case of, uh, of being a babe in the woods. Uh, there were many things that I learnt, some of them not quite the easy way. Uh, and. Uh, giving some advice to somebody starting now, I'd say very definitely uh, uh, talk to some experts uh, so that you're not going to be falling into traps. After 14 years, as he says, busting a gizzard for an electronics company which went bust, John Arngram found himself with no job and only 300 pounds in his pocket. That was way back in 1960. So John, determined that he wouldn't be caught out like this again, grabbed the opportunity and started J.N. Arngram which he built up to become one of Australia's most innovative electronic engineering companies. These days, a $3 million turnover means jobs for about 50 people in Sydney's northern suburb of Chatswood. And, impressively, it also means Australian leadership in the high-tech world of communications, design and engineering. So how necessary has it been for you to maintain very high-quality research and development? Absolutely vital. There's just no substitute for it. There has to be a very firm commitment. Our company has the workforce of 50, and we have 20 engineers. Almost all of those are engaged in research and development. Because it is such a high-tech area, how important has it been for you to be able to react to a demand quickly and manufacture to meet that demand? It's extremely important. The thing that you don't have available to you is lashings of spare time, and there are often no prizes for coming second. You have to be very realistic in the way in which you design and develop product. You have to make it in such a way as for it to be able to be into the marketplace in a reliable form very quickly. Could someone starting up in business accomplish what you have? They certainly could, but they'd have to crawl before they could walk. Nowadays, fortunately, there are available a number of helping hands. There are governmental and similar type agencies from whom they can get a lot of advice, good quality advice, and it's important that they get that first of all before they start rushing in. What's important is that you recognise there are some things you can do and other things you can't do. People such as myself with a degree of technical background finding that they're introducing themselves to business then will have many areas where they're not skilled. The important thing there is to get good quality advice. Get yourself a good accountant, a good management accountant, a good solicitor and uh, a good bank manager. That's pretty important as well. What have been the real factors of your success? Most importantly of all is to get good quality people. You've got no substitute for that. What you have to be sure of is that you're 
aiming for a very high standard. There are lots of people who will be mediocre in the way they think. Unfortunately, that isn't a formula for success. You've got to be dedicated to be providing something of high standard and you have to recognise that there are certain niches in the marketplace that you can fulfil. Australia, fortunately, has a good supply of good quality brain power and it's appropriate for us to specialise on that. There's no sense in trying to reinvent the wheel, such as calculators uh, that you get from Taiwan, but what you can supply is very good quality applied brain power. That applied brain power recently won J.N. Almgren a contract to develop a software package for telecoms network management, a system which efficiently manages the network of telecommunications on a national basis, and to contribute to the efficient operation of a global telecommunications system. As an example, if telephone facilities between Wagga and Canberra were overloaded or disrupted because of bushfires, network management would reroute all telephone traffic through other exchanges, like Albury and Melbourne. Considered one of the best systems in the world, this state-of-the-art technology is being adopted by many European countries. Again, J.N. Almgren won the software contract over international competition. What we have to do, what's vital, is to make ourselves aware of what's happening in the marketplace, what's going to happen, and then to develop our strategies to be able to get a reasonable slice of the business. The world is becoming smaller. If we do the job properly on the local scene, there's no reason why we can't compete successfully with product from across the water. Where do you see Jay and Armgren in, say, five or ten years' time? steadily developing to be an important part of the Australian communications scene. Paul Wright is one of those dream come true stories. Back in the late 60s, when he was a ballet dancer in Melbourne, his dream was to make an Australian ballet shoe as soft and flexible as the pair a visiting Russian dancer had given him. So all those years have seen him struggle to at last perfect the dream and move from a backyard garage where he and his wife made them as a hobby to a Brisbane complex where 60 people turn up 550 pairs of ballet shoes every day. But neither the dream nor building the business around it have been easy. All those years ago when you first started, Paul, where did the money come from? In those early days, it was treated as a hobby. And like any hobby, I think you just spend what you can on it at the time. That meant sort of we could buy a machine for a couple of hundred dollars and a range of lasts. That's as far as we went. Quite a few years, my wife was a dancer also, and so between our two wages, uh, that went towards subsidising the, the full-time employees when we had later on. What was the biggest problem you had? In those early years, we were raising capital when we wanted to expand. Um, but in retrospect, that was probably very wise that I couldn't raise the money. If I had, I would have probably lost it. You were really as naive as that, were you? Yes. Today, along with his ballet shoes, Paul Wright manufactures shoes for the Queensland Women's Police, aerobic shoes, jockey boots, and a line of men's casual shoes. From a naive beginner and part-time backyard manufacturer, Paul Wright has expanded into a $2.5 million a year business, providing jobs for 60 full-time employees. If it was all that tough, why did it succeed? Maybe I'm very stubborn, it was perseverance. Uh, many years I realised it wasn't an economical venture, but I just kept pursuing it. Uh, I believed in something and uh, luckily it all turned out very well. Was there ever then a moment when it just wasn't going to work? Many times. In those early years, and I would say about four or five years, we were running continually at a loss. And I remember very distinctly going to it, the accountant sort of saying, now what do I do? You know, do we continue or do we wind it up? And uh, I respect his comments because he didn't influence, influence me one way or the other. Um, he left it very open, threw it right back onto me, in other words. Uh, and I really respect that because had he said, look, it's an economic disaster, get out of it, I probably would have taken that advice. But uh, he knew I must have been stubborn, continued with all those losses, and uh, gave me the 
option of continuing it, but I may make a success of it. What sort of advice then would you give to somebody starting up in business now? Um, learn as much as they possibly can from uh, what's available. Uh, there's some very good booklets published by the Department of Industry and Commerce, which covers all aspects of uh, business, uh, from manufacturing to retailing, and I suggest very strongly anyone considering that should look at those books. You must be organised, you must plan. Put it down on paper too, it's particularly good. It's one thing having it in your head, the next thing is to get on paper. Once you've got on paper, you've got, you set yourself a goal. In the last four years, anyhow, we've had a, in our sales figures, uh, we've had a, an increase of 40% compound, which is pretty dramatic, and uh, having those increases also produces other problems, you know, financing, uh, number of employees, it's very hard to get employees now, train them, carry the debtors, everything, you know, cash flow particularly. Well, let's test your planning. Where's your company going to be in, say, two or three years? Um, we should be probably into retailing, we could be importing. We're expanding, we're, we're becoming in more independent, um, because, put it very plainly, I don't like putting more, all my eggs into one basket. We're always on the lookout for markets that are specialised, may not be very competitive. Uh, people that, the big boys, so I put them, may have overlooked it. A specialised area, they're the markets I look at. double the size of his business each year for the first four years was a goal Graham Dawson set for himself in 1980. He saw an opportunity to use his 20 years of experience in the offshore oil contracting game to service the huge business of the oil drillers of the Northwest Shelf and Southeast Asia. Perth here was the obvious base and now the 120 people at Dawson Offshore have turned a borrowed $40,000 of capital into $7 million a year of turnover of engineering contracting. Having always wanted to do his own thing, Graham Dawson is now setting up multi-million dollar joint ventures with the world's biggest undersea explorers. When you first started up four years ago, how nervous were you? How big a punt were you taking? Uh, that's been my goal, is always to take a punt. It's, you don't realise what you're getting into to begin with. It's something that you can't really judge just how far it's going to go. This is an international business that you're in. How daunting is the overseas competition? We consider that, in our own right, uh, we can compete with them on an equal basis. What we don't have as a company, of course, is the financial clout. But it doesn't scare me because the people within the, uh, the company have all been there and done it themselves in one way or another. They've worked around the world in every type of condition from very uh, calm water conditions in Southeast Asia to the roughest conditions in the, in the North Sea. Thinking back over those four years, if you had a big problem, what was it? The problem really has been to be recognised, to be given the chance to do something. Also to be recognised by the banks to uh, be able to have the funds available to uh, go from a million dollar job to a three or four million dollar job overnight. We started off with one of the major banking companies which set us up and because of, again, a relationship with the gentleman I was working with in the bank, he saw what I was able to do prior to starting my own company. He gave me the opportunity to get involved in or to start the business. How important has goal planning been for you? Have you been able to plan to achieve goals at certain points? Well, the company motto is actually challenge without boundaries. And what we're doing right now is we look at our overall progress over the next two to three year period. We estimate where we're going. We try to determine how many people required to, to get there, the type of equipment required for it. We'll be equipment orientated more than people orientated because we only need a relatively small number of people to run an operation, whether it be 10 million or 100 million dollar project. So the next phase of our development will be towards looking at getting into major pieces of equipment. Our offshore construction vessels, direct barges, lay barges, we're talking of a uh, piece of equipment which could be in the order of 40, 50, 60 million dollars. But to do this, we've got to be able to form joint ventures. What would you say have been your, really, your key points to success? 
personal will provide a professional service at all times, you never, you can never give up. You've always got to keep on going. And uh, if you don't succeed in one particular way, then you've got to look at other ways of doing things. So again, this, you've got to, have to be positive of, of, of going after things. It's very important to be at the right place at the right time. You've got to look at the market and understand that there is a market there. And the main theme at all times is to provide this very professional service. What would be your advice to any young person who wanted to go into business? I would say they'd first of all have to go as far as they can in their studies to get the background and then take it from there to where they've got to get the practical experience to go out in the field and see how the job is done. Did you seek out professional help? You've got to have professional advice. You cannot afford to expect that you know everything. You've got to call on people, use them as consultants to advise you, in particularly the financial aspects of how to set your business up, the structure of your company. And of course, as you grow, this is that much more important. Does it always go according to plan? All of a sudden, somebody will call in and say, well, look, we've got a job here, which is uh, a bit of a mad panic to get things done. Can you help us out? And uh, I think that's really the challenge again of the, of the company is that you don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow sometimes. This spoon was first prize in 1825, 160 years ago, for growing carnations at the Chelmsford Flower Show in England. Its winner, the great-grandfather of a Victorian family who now control Woodland, a two and a half million dollar a year wholesale nursery, possibly the largest of its type in Australia. But it hasn't been easy. When Morris Wood and his sons Graham and Peter decided to have a go here on their nine and a half hectares of property in 1971, they could scrape up only $7,000 between them and had to borrow the other $65,000 to get going. Thinking back to 1971, how much actual research did you do before you started up in business here? Oh, quite a considerable amount. I think that one of the most important things we needed to do was to uh, look very carefully at the skills that we had for running the size of the business we had at the time and look at the skills we'd require for the future. And uh, we found that we were very definitely lacking in managerial skills and people management and went back to school for a whole 12 months to, to do a course and we did it together. We'd tried a couple of courses before we'd done them separately and we you know, spent half our life convincing one another of the value of the course. And how important was all that knowledge to you? Changed our life. It was that important, I believe. Without it, I don't think we'd have, we'd have achieved the success that we have and it broadened our horizons. It was just that important. Conscious of the need to preserve our natural environment, Woodland avoids the use of valuable topsoil in the potting process. Instead, a special soil is created from a mixture of recycled waste products, sawdust, pine bark, coarse sand, brown coal and peat moss. Seeds are imported from around the world. Some, like the humble petunia, cost $1,800 an ounce, around six times the price of gold. The seeds are sown and germinated under conditions which are carefully controlled for heat, light and humidity. The seedlings are thinned and repotted, allowing them room to grow and develop. This labour-intensive process means jobs for 60 seasonal workers to assist the 60 full-time employees during peak periods. Graham, how would you sum up your business philosophy? We like to treat everybody else as we'd like to be treated ourselves. So I think that's very important. Service-wise, we find that there's no problems. A problem is generally created or turned into an advantage if we are to give service, immediate service, even if it's five o'clock on Friday night, we can send a taxi out as a delivery to satisfy a customer and gain quite a large contract, I think, for the next few years because we would put ourselves out. Service is something that in this country, I believe, we don't do well. And uh, any company that sets out to give really top service and is customer orientated is well on the way to success. We'll send a truck anywhere at any time to get business. Like any business, you must get complaints. How do you handle complaints from customers? All our staff, whether they be sales staff, drivers who have contact with either our staff or customers, are directed to immediately fix any complaint that we have to an advantage to our business that the customer remembers there's a favour there and we will gain business, not lose business. I think goal setting also is terribly important. You've got to decide where you're going and commit that to paper and then 
make sure that all the planning advances you all the time towards the goals that you've laid down. People don't decide where they want to go. If you never aim at anything, you never hit anything. Before we started this whole operation, we set down a plan of what we hope to achieve in the next 20 years. But people tend to laugh about that because they think, you know, 20 years is a long time. But when you start ticking it off in four or five year slots, I tell you, it goes awfully quickly. And how much have you accomplished in the plans you made 20 years ago? Well, so far, apart from uh, some of the successes we've had that we didn't plan for, the overall physical development of the place is very much on plan. At 76, Morris Wood is still active in the operation of the nursery. Here he is teaching employees a method of artificial pollination using a paintbrush. Peter and Graham acknowledge his continuing contribution and influence that has seen Woodland develop from a small part-time operation to the largest wholesale nursery in Australia with an annual turnover in excess of two and a half million dollars. He's been that much of an encouragement behind us. We have to stop him, not he stop us at times. <laughs> Well, we might have the ideas, he is the enthusiasm and the drive behind us to achieve. If you were giving advice to somebody starting out in business, what would you say are your key points to success? I think that if uh, people are contemplating going into business and they don't avail themselves of the uh, information that's available through, you know, the Small Business Management uh, Bureau and those types of places, they're really very foolish because the amount of information that's there is really tremendous. Here is just a few of the comprehensive range of low-cost publications which cover every small business application and are available through the offices of the small business agencies in each state. To help you get started, the small business agency will analyse your plans and provide professional counselling and information services free of charge. They also offer a wide range of professional advice on an ongoing basis to businesses in trouble or wishing to expand. Every year, the dream of becoming their own boss comes true for many Australians. By being fully informed and equipped with proper business skills, you could become one of the successful small business people who make the Australian economy prosper. People don't decide where they want to go. You never aim at anything, you never hit anything. A specialised area, they're the markets I look at. If you don't succeed in one particular way, then you've got to look at other ways of doing things. To know when to stop trying to do everything yourself is important too. Most importantly of all is to get good quality people. 